So, I'm going to introduce our panel. My name is Jill and Marcia is up the back. Um, we're the facilitators in the room, obviously, and we have a tremendous panel. I'm going to introduce them now at the start and not, not before they speak, so that you're clear of who they are now and you have uh, in your paperwork more details of each of our witnesses here. Firstly, we'll hear from Dan Spencer. Dan is with the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. We'll hear from <coughs> Dr. Gerald Uzunen, who has joined us from France for this occasion today. And uh, um, give him a round, round welcome, <laughs> warm applause, a round of applause. We have Ross Walmsley, the Chief Executive Officer of uh, South Australian Council of Social Service. We have Simon Longstaff, the Executive Director of the Ethics Centre, joining us from Sydney. We have Cathy O'Loughlin, who is a Community Engagement Specialist with Community Centres of South Australia. And we have Dave Sweeney, who is a National Nuclear Free Campaigner with the Australian Conservation Foundation. So as you can see, we have a terrific lineup of witnesses. We're going to get started, six minutes each, and then questions and answers at the end. So please welcome Dan Spencer. Thanks, Jill, and <coughs> thanks everyone for inviting me today. Really appreciate you guys all giving up uh, such a big amount of your time to consider such an important question. Um, firstly, I want to acknowledge the Ghana people, uh, their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge this land has never been ceded. Um, I also want to acknowledge the trauma, sickness and loss of country that has impacted many Aboriginal people in South Australia, Australia and Indigenous people around the world um, in association with the nuclear industry, uh, events like the Maralinga bomb tests. Um, and I also want to acknowledge any Aboriginal people in the room and acknowledge the fact that Aboriginal people throughout this country have consistently said no, very, very clearly, to nuclear waste dumps. And obviously we got the session later, so really looking forward to that. <coughs> for the last few years I've been working for the Australian Youth Climate Coalition as a community campaigner and a community organiser. Uh, I've been privileged to be able to work with the Port Augusta community, uh, working in their campaign for a large solar thermal plant to be built in the town to help uh, create new jobs following the coal station closure and through that I've learnt a bit about working with communities for a common purpose. Um, and South Australia is a place I grew up so I'm pretty passionate about it. I grew up on, um, in Renmark, uh, then moved to Adelaide, spent some, hey we got some Riverlanders, excellent. Um, did you bring any mandarins? I'm wasting my time, I know. Damn. Uh, next time. Um, and also spent a bit of time in Port Augusta. Um, and as a, as a young person, I think, you know, young people do want to be involved in shaping the future of our state. We recognise we've got challenges, issues like global warming, but also employment um, as old industries close. But when I work with young people and workshops I hold, I don't hear them suggesting nuclear waste as the future. And also as a young person, I kind of know what it's like to um, have to work and deal with the consequences of an issue because of decisions that were made before my generation was even born in terms of global warming. So I've spent my whole life working, adult life working on that and a little bit of time when I was at high school as well. Um, are we gonna be getting kids in 100 years, are they gonna have to be uh, dealing with social, environmental and economic consequences of a waste dump decision uh, in 100 years? So it's a, this is a serious question of interna intergenerational um, justice and equity that I think, I hope you guys consider. <coughs> But most importantly, um, when we talk about consent, um, I think the consent of Indigenous people is absolutely critical. Aboriginal people have a sacred and irreplaceable connection to this land and since 2009 this has been recognised by the Australian Government uh, through its support of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And this declaration affirms the minimum standards for the survival, dignity, security and well-being of Indigenous peoples worldwide. Under this declaration, Aboriginal communities have the right to free, prior and informed consent, and these rights should be upheld by any Australian government, including our state government. So the rights of all impacted communities across South Australia to free, prior and informed consent must be protected, and most importantly, an answer of no, which means no, has to be respected. The UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues defines free, prior and informed consent as the following. Firstly, free means there's no manipulation or coercion of the Indigenous people and the process is self-directed by the people who are impacted by the project. Secondly, 
prior implies that consent is sought sufficiently in advance of any activities being either commenced or authorised and time for the consultation process to occur must be guaranteed by the relative agents. <coughs> the informed suggests that the relevant Indigenous people receive satisfactory information on the key points of the project such as the nature, size, pace, reversibility, scope, reason and duration of the project. So when our government talks about consent from traditional owners, local communities and our state more broadly, free, prior and informed consent is the gold standard that they have to be held to. <coughs> In my view, the proposed process for the importation of international nuclear waste and the creation of waste dumps does not respect the rights of Indigenous people or the broader community to free, prior and informed consent. What's proposed by the Royal Commission is that, the, is that South Australians agree to the importation of nuclear waste before we know where it will be put. The timeline proposed by the Royal Commission would see international nuclear waste arrive in our shores at least four years before a site is finalised, which gives traditional owners and the local community no opportunity to give their consent. So once we have the waste in our state, we can't send it back, which effectively applies coercion to already marginalised people to say yes to this. And we're not also at the local and state level able to give prior or informed consent because if we don't know where the waste is going to be imported, stored, transported, how can we know the scale of the impacts? I was talking to uh, Adyamatna Elder recently about <coughs> uh, the, new, the federal waste dump that um, effectively cuts across a Dreamtime song line that, that runs across numerous Aboriginal nations. If we don't know where this site is proposed for, how can we know about those impacts that only certain people know about. So why hasn't this been built into the process? In my view it's because uh, the economic modelling of the Royal Commission shows that if we waited until year 15, uh, which is when the site is meant to be finalised, assuming no community opposition, um, <coughs> the Royal Commission's economic modelling shows that this delay would result in a 40% loss of profit value to the project. And that's in their models, that's not mine. So I think that's you know, the question this jury has to grapple with and what our Premier and our State Government have to gra grapple with, what's more important is that the free, prior and informed consent of Indigenous people, local communities and then the broader state, not the state first and then everyone else, or is it the proposed uh, economic benefits of these projects which stand on shaky ground? Thank you. Thank you, Dan. As um, Gerald comes up and prepares for his talk, and you're thinking about your questions, consider those critical thinking aspects of relevance, accuracy, depth, breadth, etc. Thank you, Jill. So good, good afternoon, uh, and uh, I'll present you the story of the development of our geological disposal project in France and share with you our experience on consent. So, as you maybe know, France has one of the largest nuclear fleets in the world with 58 reactors in operation. That means that the amount of radioactive waste to be managed is high, as, as could be for a multinational repository. High amounts can only be managed with a strong industrial organization, especially to operate a large disposal facility over more than a century. A French strategy in used nuclear fuel management lies on reprocessing. Uh, from the radioactive waste management disposal point of view, the main interest is lower volumes uh, to be disposed of, lower amounts of materials to be used for disposal, and safe quartz termination. The first politically and socially structured approach was launched by the 1991 research law in France on geological disposal, but also on studying the, all the, the possible alternatives. Uh, this law also contains clear rules for the local involvement and economic development, as well as for the control and the assessment of the research programs. Uh, for geological disposal, a call, a call for candidate sites was published in 1992, and it was led by a member of the parliament. In 1992, we had to begin from a blank sheet of paper. Over 30 candidates volunteered at that time, all distant from regions already having nuclear facilities and thus nuclear culture. From the geological criteria, eight of the candidate sites were submitted to the government. Then from a political and socioeconomic situation, four districts 
were selected by the gov government to have investigations. Three license applications were submitted in 1996 for the, the construction and the operation of uh, an underground laboratory. A vote was organized at, at each of the sites. You can see on this slide a good general support of the municipalities within a 10 kilometer radius. The support remained when moving away from the site, but at a less extent. At the end of 1998, the government decided to focus on the Meuse Haute Marne site and the license for construction and operation of the underground laboratory was granted. The underground laboratory was progressively equipped to perform all types of experiments. Firstly, scientific works. Secondly, technological works in support to the design of the repository. After the 15 years uh, research, a zone of 250 square kilometer was defined. It was called the transposition zone. Beside the review on strategies performed by the parliament and beside the two mandatory reviews by the National Review Board and the Nuclear Safety Authority, the government committed an international review under the aegis of the Nuclear Energy Agency of the OECD. At the same time, a national public debate was also launched by the government in order to find out the various positions of the stakeholders. Early 2006, another debate took, pla took place at the parliament around the new law uh, which was drafted, taking into account the previous results of our research, its reviews and the public debate report. The planning act was passed and as a result, the geological repository has been recognized as a safe long-term solution and Andra had to propose a site for the disposal and to prepare the application for commissioning the repository in 2025. At the same time, an independent review was committed by the local commission for information and oversight. Uh, they are funded independently from our work. Uh, in 2007 and 8, field works were intensified on the transposition zone uh, and during the field investigations and further experiments in the underground laboratory, a new emphasis was put on technological development, again in support to our design of the disposal facility. In October 2009, after a long and lively dialogue with local actors and having taken account the results of new geological investigations, a restricted zone of 30 square kilometers was proposed by Andra to the French government and decision was taken on the location of the, on the underground facility in 2010. The public debate is mandatory in France for any great infrastructure or project. It is organized by an independent commission specialized in public debates. It is based on our report prepared, prepared for this case. The major outcomes of the public debate was, were Firstly, a demand for an industrial pilot phase. Secondly, a master plan for operations uh, describing the life of the repository over its 120 years of operation or over four to five generations. Um, lastly, because of considerations on adaptability, flexibility and responsibility, the construction and operation of the repository will be very progressive. The master plan for operation will define all the major steps in the lifetime of the repository and will be updated every five years by a committee, including all concerned parties and stakeholders. This slide, uh, by itself, the CGO Geological Disposal Project will bring some 2,000 jobs during construction works and then between 800 and 1,000 jobs during more than 120 years. The CGO project will bring a sustained economic development to the region with new amenities. But before the industrial construction and since the beginning, local development project has been launched also with the direct involvement and support of the West producers. Last but not least, the policy for local purchases has been launched by Andra. And on this last uh, slide, uh, we illustrate the support from the state for the local development and the support was progressively increased each time that a major decision was taken during, since the beginning of our project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. It's interesting to note that Gerald did um, contribute to the Royal Commission report.
Um, so as you're preparing your questions, you might like to uh, look at that document. Our next speaker is Ross Walmsley. Thank you, and um, look, thank you for taking the time out of your busy lives to devote to trying to understand this issue and try and make sense of it. I thought <coughs> today I would try and share four reflections that I hope actually help build a bit more conversation about this issue of consent. First of these is, is consent really the right starting point for an issue like this? The second will be what role might power play? Does A third is does anyone have any more rights than anybody else? And the fourth is we all have opinions, but they're not always underpinned by evidence or fact. So let's go to this question of whether we're asking the right question, is, the right start, is consent the right starting point for an issue like this? What if the question was, do we really want this for South Australia? What that might change is rather than South Australians consent to storing and disposing of nuclear waste from other countries within our state borders, the statement might be South Australians really want the chance to store and dispose of nuclear waste from other countries within our state borders. Now, the idea of consent is, not about, is, is about approval, possibly after the fact. It's reaching an agreement that satisfies parties that have or are in dispute. In many instances, consent may be about agreeing on what's the least worst compromise rather than what's the best possible option for us. I personally think the idea of what we really want for our state places the discussion you're all having at a very different starting point. That is, this is not a proposal to which we need citizens to consent. It's something that you or we as citizens see as really desirable for our state into the future. In thinking about the question of um, what role power might play, when it comes to decisions like this, in my experience, it's often those with vested interests who dominate the decision-making processes. They often have the most resources at their disposal, have sophisticated and influential networks that link to powerful people, and have means by which to mount well-developed public relation campaigns in support of their interests. In contrast, people who are disadvantaged, poor, characterised as opponents, and sometimes even those of us that are just ordinary citizens, very rarely have access to the resources or networks of influence and are apt to not to have our views and concerns taken nearly as seriously. Proponents will often lead with exaggerated claims of the likely benefits, and when well resourced, they can actively seek to suppress opposing views using legal, marketing and political processes to minimise any opposition. On the other hand, opponents will also sometimes exaggerate problems and concerns. But, and it's a really important but, w they will rarely have the resources, connections, legal capacity, etc., of development proponents. In terms of thinking about the question of does anybody have any more rights than anyone else, I can think of at least three groups who might who some might argue may have the rights to a greater say in an issue like this one. A question for you is, should or do they? Young people, for example, who are the generation who will live with the outcomes from a decision hatched today. Possibly they have their special interests addressed if their parents and grandparents are taking their interests into account in coming to a decision to support or consent. Traditional owners. We really need to think very carefully about how tr the traditional custodians of the land have their views afforded central importance because these are the people on whose lands any facilities might be built. Communities closest, and s to, the closest to storage and on transport routes. For these people, the impacts of anything going wrong is likely to be more direct and possibly more intense and hence they too may have more rights to a greater say. And maybe there are others. If so, I'm interested in thinking about who they might be. I'd just note a caution. We should never underestimate the way that we currently devalue young people, and especially adolescents, and our brothers and sisters who are Aboriginal, and note the impact that this has on the way in which we view and respect them. Now, last but not least is this idea about 
we all have opinions, but they're not always underpinned by evidence and fact. Most of us are oriented to pursuing self-interest, and a fair few of us are still operate as NIMBYs. Similarly, when it comes to issues that are complex, just like this one, most of us are undereducated and underinformed, and may not ever want to take the time to really build a comprehensive understanding in order to form a conclusive view. Having said that, we still have no end of opinions, possibly about this issue as well. No matter how ill-informed or how poorly founded in rigorous analysis or evidence, often it's those opinions that lead political decision making. For example, despite all the statements about the importance of evidence-based practice serving as the foundation of, for where funding is directed in addressing human problems, most funding decisions are made on the back of very limited evidence of efficacy. I do think we need to think carefully how we move beyond a process like this one to inform, educate, explore and build understanding about these issues. I also note that the most likely way to ensure some level of consensus across our community would be to ensure that there is bipartisan, if not multipartisan, support from our political leaders. It doesn't mean the decision will be right, just that there will be much less likelihood of real division emerging in community views. Thank you. Dr Simon Longstaff. Okay, I'm just going to add a little bit of philosophical background to some of the things we've already been hearing about. The first thing about consent is that the way we understand it is a relatively modern concept which emerges in about the 16th and 17th centuries and it's attached to a, a core idea in ethics and that is that every single person has intrinsic dignity. That no person is merely a tool or something to be used as stock for some other purpose that with our intrinsic dignity, we have certain rights which are attached to it, certain liberty rights and things like that, and consent flows from that. So that's the first thing. Think about that intrinsic dignity of everybody. From that then, you have to reckon with the fact that consent, at least in the way it's been talked about here, is quite narrow in what it grants. It grants a right to say yes or a right to say no. It doesn't give you a grant to place additional conditions, to negotiate, to make other suggestions. And you might ask as a juror then, is consent a broad enough concept to anchor the kind of decision that has to be made at this point? The other thing about consent is that it ties very much to questions of legitimacy. And issues of legitimacy vary from culture to culture. So for example, in Indigenous society in Australia, although it's often difficult to generalise, it's quite common to find that when it comes to speaking for a particular piece of country, it's the traditional owners themselves that have the ultimate authority. You might see a land council or a regional or a state or a national body that talks about indigenous issues and they're often created to fit in with our way of coping with these things. But typically they will not have a legitimate voice for that particular piece of country. Whereas in another part, in the farming community, it might be a different decision making basis which confers legitimacy. So one of the questions you might want to ask is, when I think about consent, is it just a single standard which counts as adequate consent or do I need to take account of the relevant cultural differences that exist within the state and the nation? We've heard about the gold standard, free, prior and informed consent. I won't go back over that except to say that that is not just the standard for Indigenous people, it's the standard for everybody. Anybody who is seriously talking about consent must ensure that there's the adequate time and resources made available for it to be free, prior and informed. And of course, one of the problems that then arises is what about people who are not able to speak in relation to this? The unborn, future generations. What about non-human parts of the natural world? How do we deal with this? Well, you could say that perhaps there needs to be appointed a disinterested advocate who's there, who puts themselves into the shoes of those people and speaks on their behalf. But another potential tool is a thing developed by the philosopher John Rawls called the veil of ignorance. And under the veil of ignorance, what it asks everybody making a decision to do, including potentially you as jurors, is to say, now when I think about this, I must imagine what I would decide when I cannot know who I will be when born into the future. I might be one of the lucky few born into wealth and power and privilege, 
but I could also be born into the most marginal position in the world. I might be born close to a facility or a long way away, not knowing what would I think was a reasonable basis to decide. Last but not least, I'd ask you when thinking about the decision-making flow to consider about what next steps are both necessary and sufficient. So if I take a trivial example of making fresh lemonade, obviously it's necessary to have water, but it's not sufficient. You also require lemons and other things. Well, what in this case would be necessary and sufficient for a government to feel it's safe enough to make its final decision? For example, is it necessary that this proposal be safe, demonstrably safe, that it be sustainable, that whatever benefits accrue from it be distributed on an equitable basis, that those who've got a vested legitimate interest because of proximity or cultural or other rights that they have agreed. In other words, you can think of these necessary and sufficient conditions as a series of gateways. And one of the things the Parliament might be encouraged to consider is that whilst it ultimately reserves a right to decide, it might apply its own boundaries by saying we will not make a decision unless those preconditions are determined. So those are a few things to think about as you consider the nature of consent and how it applies in cases like this. Thanks. Thank you, Simon. Please welcome Cathy O'Loughlin. Um, thank you, and I'd like to thank you all for the invitation to speak here today. And I'd also like to acknowledge that the land we're meeting on today is the land of the Ghana people. Um, I'm here representing 103 community and neighbourhood centres across the state who support approximately 4,000 volunteers with over 35,000 people who access the centres weekly. Consent is about community members having a voice, allowing them to become determinants of their own future and to develop autonomy. Community members should be involved in decision making. They should determine what affects their future, their environment and their community. This creates joint ownership, investment and a feeling of being recognised and valued. We should engage with community members of all ages and cultures. We should value the importance of what diversity can bring. For example, as it has been previously mentioned, have all ages given their, dissent, their, their consent? The decision doesn't just affect us, it affects our children and their children and their children. Recognition of cultural customs and beliefs play a significant part in how people from different cultures feel how they interact and participate, therefore in how they are able to have a voice and give consent. Has there been networking with elders groups, leaders of cultural groups that are spe situa situated within specific communities? Has there been consultation in rural communities where members live who, and who this might affect? My thoughts on the consent pathway and the go-no-go no go point is to ask yourself the following questions. Will there be ongoing engagement and consultation the whole way through the process and the project or is it just going to occur before the decision is made? What are the existing ways of engagement, specifically for diverse groups of people? For example, those who have low literacy and numeracy or those from a different culture or those of different age brackets? And is this representative of all of our community? Are people going to communities rather than having the expectation that everyone should come here? What are the timelines and expectations? Have diverse groups been able to work at their pace without time pressures from government? Have existing relationships and networks been consulted with and recognised throughout the process? Has enough time been given for people to be, give informed consent? For example, those who can't read when all the literature is done, all the information is handed out in a written format, maybe longer, need longer time to actually understand what's happening. Or are people saying yes because they see that it is a way of pleasing us or feeling that they belong 
and are going to be accepted without understanding fully what they are saying yes about. Who is this project going to affect the most and what is their perspective and have they given form, informed consent? And has the process and engagement been ethical? I would also ask you to consider how do you consult and give consent in your own life, both personally and in your work life? What tools do you do? What information do you require? And does that process work for you? Thank you. Thanks, Cathy. As our final speaker comes up, you can start to think about the questions that you want to ask in the Q&A session. I'll introduce Dave Sweeney, our final <coughs> witness. Thanks very much, Jill, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. It's a, it's a very important forum, and you're faced and tasked with a very important role because uh, this is effectively a forever question. What is being proposed here is not a standard industrial or economic activity. It is an activity that sterilises future options and that can hardly be revoked. So that's why social consent is so pivotal. And that's not just my view as, as a person who works. I've, I've worked for 30 years in this sector, nuclear policy and politics in Australia, wearing a variety of hats in a variety of places, working with government and against government, working with communities, and engaged in a whole range of exercises and activities. The last 20 years of that 30 years has been with the Australian Conservation Foundation. It's our view that community consent is absolutely pivotal, but it's not our view, don't take our word for it. It's the international experience and there is a body and a growing body of international documentation, study and re research. I can't overstate, and I'd really like as a key message to take away from this forum, that consent is not a feel good. It is not an optional extra, it's not a middle class urban affectation. Consent is a fundamental to the process. Uh, that's been noted in the Royal Commission and it's been noted in international experience. Without social consent, there's no social licence. Without social licence, projects don't work. We've seen that. And that's recognised clearly in economic, uh, rather in uh, academic and international papers. They talk about the importance of community consent, the need to take time, the need for transparency, the need to build trust, the need to recognise that no is a legitimate response. It's not vexatious, it's not uninformed, it's not emotional, it's a legitimate position. And experience has shown, this is uh, fr citing from the European Union Nuclear Decommissioning Best Practice Guidelines, that experience has shown that without consent, nuclear waste facility will sooner or later be cancelled, stopped or indefinitely delayed, one way or the other. And we've seen that. We've seen that in Yucca Mountain in Nevada in the States where they spent 10 billion US dollars before they pushed the pause button on that project. We've seen it in Gorleben. I was in Gorleben and talking to people last month and there's been massive community protest and opposition and they have now, that's now led to a new siting procedure, a whole new siting procedure happening. That's in Germany. I picked those two of the multitude of examples in this trade internationally because Germany and the US have an existing nuclear industry. They have deep pockets. They have high levels of technical and financial capacity and resources. And both of their programs have come up on the rocks, or at least on the pause button. Something very serious to consider here. This is being promoted as an economic activity, but there are so many uncertainties. The situation of complexity, cost, contest, that has characterised this sector internationally has also characterised this sector in relation to our own reasonably modest national process. There has been for 20 years attempts by successive federal governments to impose a national facility on remote or regional communities. Many in South Australia, I note crew here in this process and in this state who have stood up, Aboriginal people at Cooper Pedy, people in the Northern Territory at Muckety, and now that process which has not enjoyed community support, which has seen contest and legal challenge, political protest and on the ground protest. What it's meant is for 20 years, we still don't have a site. We still don't have a national facility. Now that is something to learn from. That is the material that we create ourselves. 
that we have a responsibility to manage ourselves. Now we're not talking here high level international waste, it's a whole different level again. And that's recognised in international documentation and Australia needs to be mindful about compliance with international obligations and I'd cite most importantly the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People which states that there shall be no storage or disposal of hazardous materials without three prior and informed consent. Now Dan and Simon and others have, made the have spoken about three prior and informed consent. That is pivotal in this. And it is, gives us some also some benchmarks and some yardsticks and some ways to quantify what is consent so that it's not an arbitrary decision. It actually has some procedural marker points and we need to comply with that. And I would posit that Aboriginal people, many of them, and I urge and look forward to the next session, many Aboriginal people have clearly made their opposition clear. What we need to do and consider, and what I'd urge you to do and consider, is in your deliberations to ensure that when we talk about consent, we recognise that it doesn't become a process where yes means yes and no means not yet. We need to recognise respect and reflect people's right to say no because if you can't say no if you haven't got a right to say to say no you've never really said yes and it's really important to to represent that that integrity of process and that integrity of outcome and i would uh, just say that consent cannot be achieved by attrition by resignation by by manipulation it takes time it takes trust and it takes transparency, and particularly when the stakes are as high as they are in this discussion and in this consideration. So I wish you great success, and I'm open to any questions now and into the future, but this is such a significant decision, and the consent factor and the right to say no is so pivotal. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, and thank you to all our witnesses. I'm going to give you two minutes now to turn to the people around you and really distill some questions that you want to ask. Please make them questions, not statements, and please make them clear and succinct and we will get through as many as we can. Two minutes. <laughs> 
three, one, two, three. What happened? That's barbecue. It's all bloat. <laughs> Think about it, ladies. All right, here we go. This is a quick question. Well, it can't be quick, but it's to Ross to convert, and it's to everyone really, to convert your philosophy into psychology. And that's 16, year 1600 that you used as a yardstick. I would argue Western society is turning into an individualistic society and leaving the collective knowledge behind and becoming more rational. Now, the que well, the question is, can we use your philosophy as a psychology rather than a philosophy? Uh, you can certainly reflect on that and bear in mind that not all cultures adopted that individualistic approach. <laughs> For example, notions of individual consent don't work in many indigenous communities where it's a collective decision made around issues of cultural legitimacy, I, as I mentioned. So yes, you can, but the thing to do about it is to reflect on those sources and see what they mean rather than just take it for granted. And I think that's the implication of your question. Hello, my name's Fuzzy Trojan. Um, I've been thinking about the headline that's going to be in the paper after we finish our deliberations. And it seems to me the most likely one is citizens' jury gives green light to further investigation. And that sort of suggests that we're in favour of it when we may not be. What do you think? Well, I think, I think it's in your hands. <laughs> um, there's, there's every possibility that that might be the case, um, but it's really in your hands now to work out. And I, I would encourage you to think about, in particularly in the context of consent, some of the stuff Simon was saying around conditional consent and whether there are a series of conditions that you might want to set in place in order to um, be confident that something should be advanced, which might compete with that. I think that's really interesting. Um, and I think it fits into my sense of the yes means yes and no means not yet. Um, framing is, is vital. Um, and I'm never one to take away agency of a community. I think so much is in your hands as jurors in this process and push on that. But at the same time, it's not. It's not in the hands. You're not the ed ed editor of the Adelaide Advertiser. I think that what the headline should be, not predicting, is the jury's still out. Hi, my name's Peter. My question is actually for the whole panel. Um, assuming that there is free, prior, informed consent from the majority of the population and taking into account the conditions associated with particular groups within the population, so specifically the Indigenous uh, our Indigenous uh, brothers, should we then apply the democratic principle of majority rule? Yeah, so if each of the gateways have been opened, then once you get into the area of, say, the parliament making a decision on the basis of the state, then you would apply what is the legitimate decision process that exists in that environment, which is a majority rules decision within the parliament itself. So, but the point is, will the parliament accept to bind itself to the point that it won't exercise that process until those gates have been opened? That's the really the threshold question for the jury in terms of the decision-making process, whether it exists on that. Once you, and, and, and that, what I'm saying is not selectively applied to the parliament. Equally, there'll be a legitimate decision-making process for somewhere else where the gate is. It's got to be done in its own particular way. So you shouldn't look for uniformity. You should look for what is legitimate in each particular context. If all gates are open, then it has its final say at that point. Uh, my question is to Gerald. Uh, you said that the facility or uh, thinking on the proposal started in 1991. It'll start being built in 2025 with uh, an update every five years depending on new technologies. At what point if, would you seek to, to uh, get re-consent or re-seek re consent if major technological changes occur? And also to the panel as a whole, once we give consent, this is irreversible. Uh, how do we stop something? If, if something comes up in say 10, 15, 20 years, how do we stop it? What do we do? Good. 
to, to, to make it short, um, we had the first decision uh, in the early uh, 90s uh, with the site, with the communities volunteering for an underground laboratory. Then we had uh, three sites which were selected and applied for an underground laboratory. Only one was uh, selected. We had a very progressive decision. In 2006, after 15 years research, uh, we had the decision in principle that we'll have the, the underground uh, geological disposal. Then in 2009, we, pro we located the site for the underground, for disposing of underground. Then we had another level of decision by the government in 2010. In 2013, we had a public debate. We had a very progressive step-by-step step, uh, decision. Okay, so it will be updated every five years once we begin the operation. No, uh, we don't go uh, directly to the public, but we had again a debate at the parliament last July, and every five or ten years we have this debate, and we have the, the public debate between uh, all citizens, including the level, the national level with the parliament, as well as the local level, and each time we, we update and we progress. We're going to take one last question. Um, Dave's going to make a quick comment and then we're going to our last question. I think, I think what you've said really highlights a couple of key things. The information deficiency that we, we have now and the stuff that we need to know, because otherwise the, there needs to be real front-ended decision-making here because you don't go back. If there's high-level radioactive waste on South Australian land and there's not agreement of a site, that's a real mess for this state and for this nation. So there is a burden here to front-end the decision-making really seriously. And the second point is you said, what can we do if things go wrong or change? It's eternal vigilance. It's what you're doing now. It's engaging and being an active citizenry because that is the best defence of any decision-making in a democracy. Eternal vigilance and engagement. Hi, I'm Mark. Um, I guess I was just looking for elaboration on, on the NIMBY idea and consent uh, that Ross and Simon spoke about. Um, we've heard the numbers are pretty rubbery on this, but if they were realistic, if we were going to make such an enormous amount of money that it benefited the state, is it reasonable for one group to still be able to veto the project, to say no, um, you know, arguably at the detriment of the state as a whole? I'm more than happy to, to be told, yes, it is. <laughs> um, I think governments around the world have recognised that Indigenous people have a special relationship and cultural connection to their countries. We've never had a treaty here um, in Australia, and so Aboriginal groups absolutely have the right to protect their land and their culture from a waste dump if they choose to. So I think... A, a real risk of the majority rules thing is the majority of South Australians live in Adelaide, unlikely to be the place where the thing's put. Um, so regional communities need to be on board, but most importantly, Aboriginal groups need the right to veto. And I think the state parliament should actually be passing a law that guarantees it because native title doesn't guarantee it. It's a process of compensation and consultation that eventually gets to yes normally. It doesn't protect people's rights to say no. So we need that very, very clearly in law general theory, uh, there are times when the, the general good overrides any group or individuals, but they're usually when there's some kind of existential threat. So if you're at war and you have to take over a dock land or something like that for national security, then you may make that decision even though the individuals who own it might say no. Um, it's a different situation though when you face an existential threat than what is simply an opportunity amongst others. And if you felt um, that this was just an opportunity, then you wouldn't have, in those cases, justification to override what is a, legit a legitimate claim made by others. And so you've got to calibrate in your own mind what you see this as, whether it's responding to an existential threat or actually taking up an opportunity where there may be other options available too. Thank you. And just very quickly, one other aspect on this is this is not just a South Australian decision. I think it's pivotal that we remember the, that we are Australians. 
This requires a national government support, bipartisan support. It requires international agreements with Australia as a state party. It would require consent of the Australian people. South Australians most affected, but it's circles of radius and it is a national interest and a national decision. Okay, I'm very well aware that there are several unanswered questions in the room and for that I apologise. We are due up in the hall in K uh, very shortly to have our Indigenous witness session and we want to honour that. Before you start to move, I would like to you to thank our witnesses and uh, I thank you as well. <laughs>